And thank you everyone for being here virtually. You know, it's not quite the same as in person, but still I'm glad that everyone's making an effort um, to come out for this. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started here. So my name is Jake Boy, Senior Application Scientist with Scientific Bioprocessing. And today I'll be talking to you about real-time sensing of pH and dissolved oxygen in microfluidics devices. So starting off a little bit about our company. So Scientific Bioprocessing is a subsidiary um, of a much older company called Scientific Industries. Um, Scientific Industries invented the Vortex Genie, which is just a little shaking device. I'm sure a lot of you have seen that in different labs, if not in your own lab. Um, and so in collaboration with UMBC and Dr. Govind Rao, we have developed um, a suite of optical sensors and different technology that allows us to use those sensors. So, um, you know, when it comes to making sensing technology, we think that there are several things that you just really cannot sacrifice on. One, the sensors need to be reliable um, and they need to provide real time monitoring from the smallest to the largest vessel. And we'll talk a lot more about that a little later. Um, they should also provide the opportunity for automatic control in closed loop systems. The, uh, the parameters at the cellular level should remain um, physiologically relevant throughout your experiment. And the sensor should also be economically remarkable. Um, in other words, they should be inexpensive. So a little bit about what, um, what we're really trying to get at here. So traditional sensing types, these, these electrodes like Clark electrodes um, and different types of electrochemical probes, these things don't work in small devices like microfluidics devices and even things like tea flasks and shake flasks and the like. So, Optical sensors, um, on the other hand, are a different type of sensor, and I'll get into explaining what that's about. But first, I want to highlight something here, and this is uh, this is the PAT initiative proposed by the FDA. And you know, back in the springtime when we could go to these conferences, um, the FDA was always present, and there's always conversations about what the new regulations are going to be um, and how we can move this industry from an R&D project and move it away from sort of an art form to more of a hard science um, with GMP manufacturing. And the, P the PAT initiative is really part of this. And really what the FDA is proposing here is consistency throughout your entire experiment. So, um, and where this fits into the sensing world, we want to be able to use a sensing system in the smallest devices all the way up to the largest devices throughout the entirety of your experiment. So if you're using something like an organ on a chip device, we want to be able to use the same sensing system as if we were going to be doing troubleshooting in some other type of culture vessel. Um, and so something like maybe a tea flask or a Petri dish or a shake flask, all the way up through large scale bioreactor systems and then all the way back down. We don't want to have to change the sensing system that we're using in any of these devices. So optical sensors. Optical sensors can deliver data um, in different ways that really never used to be possible. And I mentioned electrodes pre, uh, you know, in a couple of slides ago. Those types of things don't work in small devices. They're just too big and too clunky, oftentimes too expensive and often a burden to have to, to um, always sterilize them. So optical sensors are really, really tiny um, and they can fit into any type of system that, that's out there right now, including microfluidics devices. And I'll show you a little bit more about this here in a minute. So. Optical sensors allow us to do sensing um, in places we couldn't before. And in this example here, we have um, a study done at VCU using chondrocytes. And these people were growing cells in Petri dishes. And they were growing the cells in a CO2 incubator. Um, and they wanted to know what was happening with the pH during their experiment. So using optical sensors, they were able to actually track the pH throughout the entirety of this experiment, which you can see it was a 24 hour run in a Petri dish. Um, and you know, we're talking about a really low fill volume in something that you can't just stick an electrode in and you don't wanna be drawing samples from it for risk of contamination. Um, and also, you know, pH and oxygen values change when you take offline sensing, especially in a run as short as this. So introducing one of our most basic product offerings, the ID Developers Kit. And really this kit is uh, designed to get you started into optical sensing. And it also provides versatility that allows us to see some of the capabilities of this technology. So here you can see um, a layout of what the developer's kit looks like with several different devices. Uh, we're going with a T75 there, a multi-well dish, which I know is a big deal in microfluidics, um, a shake flask, and then also just an evaporating dish. So you can see we can accommodate all these types and even more, which I'll show you here in a minute. 
So just a little bit about optical sensors and what their capabilities are. Um, so the measurement range for pH is from six to eight, mammalian physiological range, dissolved oxygen, uh, again, zero to 100%. These sensors have an incredibly fast response time. Um, and that's one of the things we really, really like about them. They operate in temperatures between five and 50 degrees Celsius. So the standard 37 is great. Um, the sensors come pre-calibrated. They can be autoclaved. They can be gamma irradiated. Um, and they last for a really long time. So you can have a, an experiment running for, you know, for a day, for three days, for a week, two weeks, all the way up to several months without having to change the sensor that you're using. Um, really the biggest advantage to the sensors is the, the variability and the versatility and the size. So the, the sensors can be anywhere from, you know, a one centimeter square and they're 0.3 millimeters tall. So just a couple of pieces of paper stacked on top of each other. Um, and they get down to three millimeters in diameter. So you can imagine a three millimeter diameter sensor with a 0.3 millimeter height um, being placed into your microfluidics device or some other application that you have in mind for it. And another great thing about these sensors is they're meant to be single use. So you use them one time, uh, you throw them away so there's no sterilization and risk of contamination and there's no clunky work that a lab tech has to do to sterilize these things. You plug and play, you run, you run and then you throw them away when you're done. Um, and they're really inexpensive, so you can get started again, and, and the cost is not prohibitive for running multiple experiments. So getting into microfluidics devices and how optical sensors can accommodate them. Um, so we provide real-time sensing uh, for long-term experiments, and what we're really about is reproducibility and quality control when you know your parameters when you're running these experiments. Um, and we thought of several different ways the optical sensors can be integrated into microfluidics devices like organ on a chip. Um, so the best way, and um, probably my favorite way, I'll show you here in a little bit, is if we can integrate these sensors directly into the organ on a chip device. So there's oftentimes reservoirs, and sometimes these reservoirs in those, um, in those chips, the little wells, they can be three millimeters, four millimeters, something like that. These sensors can fit directly in to those wells in the organ on a chip devices. Oftentimes you can make um, you know, something like a three millimeter well and then run a small channel to it if you wanted to wash um, some, port of your, some part of your chip and wash it into where the sensor is sitting to get an idea of the pH, for example, in that media wash. Um, also in the flow through cell, um, in perfusion loops, so you can imagine that if you have your media reservoir and the tube running from that reservoir to the organ on a chip device, we can use a flow through cell to put sensors in that line also the flow out. Um, and then we can also put sensors in the media reservoir themselves, as well as the waste container to measure differences between the two. So organ on a chip devices, um, these things are really going to take off. That's our belief. And we've heard talk of the FDA um, trying to get rid of animal testing in the United States. And I think this is something they've, they've more or less done in Europe. Um, so it's something that's coming. And organ on a chip devices are designed to take the place of animal testing, and really they are a better option anyways. Um, so they can be a lot cheaper than running you know, an animal farm, and um, we can have results that are much more physiologically re relevant for humans, because we can actually use human tissue in these devices. Um, and I'm sure you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is a really, really budding technology, and it's going to need some type of sensing system that works with it. Um, so that we can really take it to the next level. So here we see a, a pretty standard setup uh, for an organ on a chip device. And you can see here in the diagram on the right, so we can imagine that we would integrate optical sensors in some of those three ways that we talked about. We see here the reservoir, we see the perfusion lines, and we also see the wells inside of the chip itself. And our sensors can go into any of these places that you see here in this diagram. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with something that looks like this. And you can imagine doing dissolved oxygen and pH sensing in your system in multiple different places at a time. And here we have an organ on a chip device that we're working with a collaborator on. And um, you can see the sensors are embedded in the chip right here. So um, they, these are three millimeter wells that are in this chip. And then you can see the small channels uh, with the media ports that lead to the sensor. The sensor are the white spots that you see in this chip. And you can see we can integrate these directly into a chip just like this. The sensors, again, are three millimeters. Um, and the other really amazing thing about this is the fill volume required to get an accurate reading. 
Um, in this in this application right here, we use 10 microliters of fluid. Uh, so just 10 microliters of media, and we were able to get an accurate pH reading doing that, and a very consistent reading as well. So you can see that these sensors are made perfectly to accommodate small devices like this that are using really low fill volumes and have really small constraints on space. So now that we've talked a little bit about optical sensors, I just want to point out um, some studies that have been done, studies that would not have been possible without something like optical sensing technology. And really the point of showing these studies, uh, we're going to be talking about T-flasks here, but really the point of showing these studies is to get your minds thinking about what is possible with a new sensing system like this. What can I do now that I know this sensing system exists that I could not do before? And that's what these people in these studies have done. So the researchers wanted to look at a couple of different tea flasks, and they wanted to test one of these uh, age-old myths that exists in cell culture. So they had two T225 T2 flasks with a four millimeter liquid depth, and they're growing these in standard CO2 incubators. And what they wanted to do was check and see if partially opening the cap of that tea flask actually makes a difference as opposed to leaving the cap closed. And I know this is a pretty standard practice that people do with tea flasks because you know, it, it seems to be logical that if we crack the cap, it's going to allow more gas to exchange and to allow the cells to metabolize um, more comfortably and not to go hypoxic. But what the researchers were able to show here using optical sensors is that this is not necessarily effective. You can see here the two flasks growing in parallel in the same conditions and the partially open flask became hypoxic, nearly anoxic after about 60 hours. And, and almost the exact same thing happened with the closed flask. So what we're seeing here is that once the cells are inoculated, after they start to metabolize, they're using up that oxygen at the bottom of that liquid layer much more quickly than that can be replenished because, you know, gas does not diffuse into liquid very quickly at all. Um, it just doesn't. And if media is sitting there statically in the incubator, it's really acting as an insulating layer that does not allow this gas phase to reach the cells where they're growing and actually needing the oxygen. Um, so yeah, the scientists here just drew the hypothesis that the cells um, were not able to, to metabolize oxygen because there was no oxygen available as they were metabolizing and um, creating CO2. That CO2 sits on top of the cells and makes a more acidic layer and, and the oxygen is not diffusing through the liquid fast enough to feed the cells at the rate that they need it. So they were able to determine in this study that T flasks, which you know may come as a shock to many, are overwhelmingly liquid phase mass transfer limited. The liquid acts as an insulating layer that does not allow the T flask to effectively oxygenate cells. Um, so the authors here, you know, they have this data that they were able to gather with the optical sensors, and now they're able to come to the next point and say, okay, how can we innovate? How can we fix this? And they propose gentle agitation as a means to correct this issue. So here you can see the study on the right, um, the experimental setup, and this is a T75 flask growing in a CO2 incubator. Pretty typical uh, for what you would see, but the difference here is that they put this on a rocking platform and allow the T flask to rock back and forth to, to break up that insulating media layer and to hopefully allow the cells to receive more oxygen. And you can see here on the left, you see that, that blue LED, uh, or even on the top right, the blue LED that's shining through um, the sensor patch. And you can see that's what the optical sensor would look like inside of a T flask here. So um, it's really low profile. And, and, and again, the researchers are able to test this hypothesis, really put this, this age old T flask to the test using this new technology. And their results were really striking. So here we see in figure C, um, the cells were able to maintain a much higher level of oxygen, and that's represented there in the red, which is the rocking T75. The black line is the static T75, and the same you can see in figure D, which is showing pH, and we'll zoom in here in a second. So this is figure D showing the pH that was experienced by the cells in that T75 flask. Um, the black line is a static T flask. The red line is the T flask that was rocking back and forth. And you can see that the cells were able to maintain more physiologically relevant levels of pH um, using that gentle agitation. And this is, you know, for, for some obvious reasons, but really it's because as the cells are respiring, they create CO2. That CO2 is heavy, it sits on top of the cells and acidifies them. 
but if you rock the media and mix that around and dilute that CO2, dilute that acid just a little bit, you can allow the cells to maintain a, um, a better level of pH as they're growing. And again, another important thing here is that they, the cells that were rocking had a 31% higher antibody titer than their static flasks. And this is just evidence that when cells are given more physiologically relevant conditions, they're going to perform much better. And here is figure C, which shows the oxygen, a very similar setup to the last one. And we can see that the oxygen level maintained you know, really high, really didn't drop much at all throughout the experiment, um, whereas the static flask, that oxygen level really dipped to hypoxic and anoxic conditions. And this is really important because, you know, especially nowadays, there's a lot of research being done on the effects of oxygen, particularly with cells. Um, and, and that's even become bigger now in the COVID era. Um, and studies like this are really taking off and really pointing out some flaws in the way that we grow cells now, which are kind of inconvenient, but really need to be brought up because there's a lot of issues with the way cell culture is currently done. And so we have things called normoxic, normoxic conditions. And these are the conditions that cells would experience in a physiologically relevant setting. So all the cells in your body have different levels of oxygen that they want to experience based on how far away they are from a blood vessel, essentially. And we want to be able to grow cells in the conditions that they want to experience to have the best health and the best genetic um, stability. And there are lots of studies out there right now that show that cells have genetic instability and chromosomal instability, instability higher mutation rates when they're not experiencing normoxic conditions. So hypoxia or too much, too much oxygen in other instances can cause cells to have phenotypes that ultimately are not what we're looking for and, and even scarier genotypes that we're not looking for that we can't really see until it's too late. So monitoring dissolved oxygen is really, really important um, is the bottom line. And this is something that we cannot do right now when we're growing things in tea flasks and shake flasks and you know petri dishes. And microfluidics devices could fall into that same category oftentimes. If you want to do sensing in your organ on a chip device, it's not so easy to find a sensing system that works until optical sensors came about. And now we can actually do that in those small devices. So again, here is just another study that, sh that shows something similar. And uh, you know, I, I know we're a little short on time, so I'll run through this one a little quickly, but really it's just going to reiterate what we spoke about before. And that's that's the fact that we're able to put the T-flask to the test using this new sensing system. So the idea here is that we can look at devices, we can look at technology in different ways because now we have sensing technology that has caught up and allowed us to really test some of the things that we've done for a long time. And you know, a lot of times people will grow things in T-flasks and if you ask them why are you using that type of flask, they might point to something like, oh, the surface area to the volume ratio of the media is really good. It's better than what else is out there. And, and the thought behind that is that it would allow oxygen to travel through that media and feed the cells um, at an appropriate rate. But what they were able to find when they tested the T-flask is that if it's growing in a static condition, that surface area to volume ratio really is not that important. So they compared three flask geometries, the T25, T75, T150, and then several different flask types like spinner flasks. And the idea here was to see if the KLA of any of these flask types could match that of a 10 liter wave bioreactor. So basically, can we scale up these small devices in terms of KLA, which is, which, you know, uh, if you're not familiar with KLA, it's the, the mass transfer coefficient, basically the ability of the gas phase in your incubator to travel through the liquid and reach the cells. How well can that liquid transfer that gas? Um, so we're measuring, measuring this KLA and seeing if we can scale up from any of these small devices and reasonably mimic the KLA in a 10 liter wave bioreactor. Um, and the sensors, you, or the, um, the, the researchers use optical sensors, again, to be able to test something like this. And what they're able to find is really interesting. If you're using a T-flask and introducing that gentle agitation that the prior study showed to us, you can get some pretty striking results where a T-flask can actually mimic, and this is a T75, can actually mimic a 10 liter wave bioreactor um, in terms of um, protein titer performance. So here we see um, on the right, the cultibag is in red, the rocking T flask is in black in figure C. And we see here that the dissolved oxygen levels are very consistent for both of these types. Um, 
And then in figure D, we're looking at the pH um, of a rocking tea flask and a culture bag. And you can see that these are tracking really, really well for how they're able to maintain levels of pH, which is really surprising. What this is showing us is that a T75 can scale up to this larger device and really matches performance if the tea flask is rocking. Um, and then here we see the protein titer. The culture bag um, outperforms the T75 in this case, but still they are comparable results. And this really, really amazing um, study was, was able to be performed with the use of optical sensors, something that really would have remained a mystery without this type of technology. So here's a chart showing how the T flask, the rocking T flask performed versus other um, culture devices. And this was, the, all of this data was produced again using the optical sensors to measure this KLA value um, throughout these devices and really putting them to test uh, to see which ones did the best. And, and still the T-flask did outperform the others, but it must be a rocking T-flask in order to provide these, these results. And I know this is a busy slide, so if anyone wants this presentation afterwards, um, you know, I have the bibliography and I have the whole presentation. I can send anyone if they want to review any of this. So the conclusion here is that the rocking T-flask has superior oxygen transfer capabilities. Um, compared to other small devices. So we use the term PSD here, which is a process scouting device. That's just a small device that you use and scale down or scale up um, to test your experimental design, to scout your process more or less. Um, and that's what they were able to find using these optical sensors in these flask types. So now a little bit about our technology. So this is the ID reader. This is um, the most basic instrument that Sends, so it sends light to the optical sensor patches and then they return a signal that's interpreted as either pH or dissolved oxygen. Um, this thing is a 90 millimeters in diameter, 15 millimeters in height, and it's sterilizable, it's watertight, it's meant for use inside or outside of a CO2 incubator. Um, so it can operate at 37 degrees, it can be sterilized via ethanol wiping. And the thing that we really love about this device um, is that it provides two different sensing channels with one single device. So you see an A and a B there on the little on the um, ID reader, and those both refer to different sensing channels. So we can do two channels of dissolved oxygen, two channels of pH, or one of each all at the same time. And this can be configured with one click in the software. So the way that this works, um, for those of you who are not familiar with this type of technology, the sensor patch goes inside of a culture vessel, and you can see that here represented on the left. The culture vessel is the yellow. You can see some protons floating around, some oxygen molecules floating around, and the sensor patch is placed in the device in sterile conditions before inoculation. And then that's it. Once that thing is in there, you don't have to open it up again. There's no wires that come in or out. It's just in the device. It's integrated in the device as part of the device. That's the way to think about it. So this is really minimally invasive. If, you know, minimally invasive, we'll say, maybe non-invasive. Um, and the way that it works is the reader sits underneath this and sends light through the wall of the culture vessel. Um, and then that, that sensor patch fluoresces and returns a signal and a dissolved oxygen or pH reading is then provided. And so, this is really nice because it allows us to do sensing without having to really affect the experiment. We have the sensor patch that becomes integrated into the system, and then the reader is only sending light through the wall. Um, and it really helps accommodate a lot of different applications. Um, so we, we previously showed the form factor of the ID reader um, that is in its most basic form, but we understand that that does not fit all applications, particularly microfluidics. So, what we have are fiber optic enabled readers, where we have fiber optic cables that run from the reader um, to any remote location where a sensor might be placed. And you can see again here, there are two fiber optic cables coming off of one reader. This is because we have two sensing channels in this one reader. And what something like this device might allow you to do, if you can use your imagination, if you had a flow through cell in your inline, um, going from your media reservoir to your organ on a chip device, and you had a flow cell on the outflow, um, so the waste media, you could measure uh, the dissolved oxygen or the pH in both of those lines at the exact same time to get an idea of what's happening to your media as it passes through your organ on a chip device. You can also measure different wells in your device at the same time. So you can get two simultaneous dissolved oxygen readings from two different locations using just one device. These cables are three millimeters jacketed, so two millimeter cores, and this allows for the use of three millimeter diameter sensors. 
Um, so again, we, we really talked about a lot of this already, but the sensors, this just is pointing out some of the versatility. Great for R&D. So if you want to scale down, uh, you know, you have some troubleshooting you need to do in your process. You want to scale down to some other device. You can use these sensors for the scale down. You can use them before you even scale up. So as you're testing things in something like a T-flask or a multi-well plate, um, you can use the sensing system there. And then as you scale up, you can use the same sensing system once you get to the end of your experiment and all throughout the different steps. Um, so once you have all this information about sensing, what do you do with it? And we think environmental control. So moving towards automation, taking the art and the human element out of cell culture and making it more automated and consistent and turning it into a science that is GMP manufacturing. So one of the devices here is the rocker. Um, and this is, this is coming from that one study that we showed you where rocking T-flasks outperform really any other static culture device and um, can really match larger bioreactor systems. So if you're looking to scale up from something small like this, you want to create a rocking condition so that the T-flask can actually perform well enough um, to allow you to scale up without scratching your head at the end of the day and wondering what went wrong as I scaled up. Why was my T-flask that was sitting static in my incubator not representative of the rest of my process? So this type of device allows you to create um, an environment where your T-flasks can become um, really good proxies for what the end result of your experimental design will look like. There's also the ID shaker. This is a standard shaker table that has um, custom holders that allow us to attach shake flasks to the ID reader device. And then the software. So we come with our own suite of software. This allows you to view your readings in real time. You can get readings as quickly as every 10 seconds. Um, and it has a nice graphical, graphical display that you can see in real time updating. It also has um, data logging. So you can save your experiment for as long as you want. The data logging software will continue to save data um, no matter how long you're running this experiment. And so you're always going to be able to, to look back on what you did and, what, and, and help improve your process using that type of data. So in the future, we plan for glucose, lactate, glutamine, and CO2. Um, so we want to eventually bring you an entire suite of metabolite um, sensing that you can use optically and you can have basically a one-stop shop for all of your sensing needs. So here's the bibliography if anyone wants to take a look at this later on. And with that, I will open to your imagination and any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.